Hello. So today I wanted to show you how to make this cool ray marching shader in Godot 4.1. It uses a 3D Perlin noise field that we created in the last video. But if you just want to skip that, the code for the 3D noise algorithm is on my GitHub in the description. The initial code I used to create the SDS sphere was based on this shader code provided on GodotShaders.com which is itself a Godot adaptation of this video by The Art of Code detailing how to create a simple ray marcher in Unity. Then we're going to use the 3D noise field we created in the last video to affect the internal density of the SDF object, and the code is heavily inspired by this ray marching project by Jeremy Pelliard. So we are going to learn how to control the density threshold, the noise transformation and scale, and even this really cool distortion effect. Before we begin, here's a quick explanation of ray marching. Feel free to skip if you just want to get into how to make the shader. So this is our camera, and this is our cube. We're going to try to use ray marching to render a sphere in the bounds of this cube. We would start out by defining a center and radius size for the sphere. The center would be the origin of the box, and let's say the radius is 0.5. The way the ray marching works is that it'll calculate the distance from the camera to the surface of the sphere using a signed distance function. For a sphere, this formula is as simple as the distance from the camera to the sphere center minus the radius. Then, just like in ray tracing, we'll shoot rays from the camera to every fragment of the object. But instead of just seeing what the ray hits, we will march the ray one step by the distance to the sphere's surface that we calculate with the sine distance equation. Then we will take this new position of the ray and we will find the distance from this point to the sphere's surface with the sine distance function. And then once again, we march another step by this new distance. But for this ray, we can see that it will never hit the sphere. So we set a maximum amount of steps a ray is allowed to march, like 100. And then, alternatively, a ray that is going to intersect with the shape, the distance required for that ray to travel will keep approaching zero for infinity, unless we define a minimum surface distance. Or until it reaches the max steps we would have already defined. This algorithm will march a ray like this for every fragment of the bounding box. So now let's start making our ray march shader. To begin, I'll add a box mesh. And then I'll make a new shader. I'll call it ray march. First, I'll set the render mode to unshaded because I'm just going to be displaying the normal colors to give a sense of depth rather than working with lighting information because that would be its own video. Let's make some constant variables. Max distance will be 100.0. Max steps will be 100. And surface distance will be this. This is 0 0.001 in scientific notation. All right, next let's make some varying variables. This one will be our camera's position local to the object. And position will be for the vertex position on the object. That will be interpolated into the fragment shader later. The camera is where we shoot our rays from and they are fired in the direction of the vertex positions. And you can get the camera's position in object space using some weird matrix transformation right here. Alright, now down to the fragment shader here. I'll make a variable for ray origin, which is the camera position, ray direction, will be position minus ray origin, normalize. Then we'll make another vector 3 to store the normal for each fragment, because that is how we are going to color our object and show depth. 
and then another vector 3 to store the color data. That will make the float call D for the distance returned by this ray march function we'll be making soon. At the end of the ray march, it will return the final distance of the ray from the object's origin. So now, if the distance returned by the ray march is greater than the max distance, we can discard the fragment. Next, for any rays that intersect the shape, I'll make a vector 3 called P to store the position of the surface point in local space. We do this by taking the ray origin and the ray direction times the distance. Next, we will calculate the normal of that position using another function we will define soon called getNormal. I'll pass that to this color variable and set albedo. Alright, so that's the majority of how this shader works. All we have to do now is define the raymarch function and the getNormal function. So the raymarch function returns a float and takes the ray origin and ray direction as parameters. We'll make a float called DO. This is a distance the ray has already traveled. This will accumulate during the ray march loop, so it starts at 0.0. .0. This float, DS, will store the distance for the ray to travel on the next step. Now we'll start our ray march loop. For int i equals 0, while i is less than max steps and increment, in the for loop, let's get our ray position with ray origin plus do times ray direction. Now we calculate the distance we have to travel with another function we have to define after this, and I'm just going to call it SDF sphere distance because it's going to return the sign distance to the sphere surface given the ray position. Then we take this distance and add it to DO so that the value accumulates every loop. Now every time the distance is calculated and the ray is marched forward, we can check to see if DS is smaller than surface distance, or if D0 is greater than max distance, and if so, we break from the loop. Lastly, I'll return the final distance of the ray march. So now let's go ahead and make this SDF sphere function. All we are going to do is return the vector length of position p and subtract the radius of the sphere like we said with shape size. Next let's create our getNormal function. I'll create a vector 2 called e for epsilon so I can just do swizzling for the normal calculation. If you don't know what swizzling is, it's using a string of characters after the period to access specific components of a vector, like this. To calculate the normal, we will use the finite distance approximation equation that looks like this. Then we return normalized n. Wow, look at that. We have our SDS sphere. I can adjust the size with this shape size slider. All right, so now what we're gonna do is use the 3D Perlin noise that we created in the last video by sampling the 3D noise texture at points throughout the volume of the sphere and comparing it to a density threshold variable and only rendering the normal color for the point once it crosses the threshold. At the moment, our ray march algorithm detects the surface of the sphere and breaks from the ray march loop and displays the color. What we need to do now is after the ray reaches the surface of the sphere, continue to march inside of the object and all the way through, sampling the noise texture at each point. Before, when we calculated the signed distance from ray to the sphere, we were using an adaptive step size approach. For simplicity, when the rays pass through the surface, we will switch to a fixed step size, meaning we will set the distance the ray must march before sampling the texture. If this sounds computationally expensive, that's because it is and is why Blender's volumetrics can really slow down your computer at high resolutions. So to start, I want to copy and paste my noise texture functions that we made in the last video into our Raymarch shader.
We will also need to add a uniform variable with this called noise scale. I'm also going to want to add some other ways to manipulate the noise. So let's add noise transform and density threshold. Noise transform is going to let me move around the noise texture in 3D space. So I'll go down to the noise 3D function and I'll add UVW plus equals noise transform. Now I need to make some changes to the fragment function. So right here is where we find our surface point on the sphere. So now I will sample the noise texture by finding the noise value at point P. And if the noise value is greater than the density threshold, we will display the normal color. Cool. Now you can see our noise texture is affecting our sphere. So now if the noise value is less than the density threshold, I will want to continue to ray march into the sphere. I need to make some more uniform variables, volume step size and volume max steps. So now we can start raymarching here in the fragment function with this for loop. We'll sample the noise texture again at this new point. Oops, I accidentally made volume max steps a float instead of an integer. So now if the noise value is less than or equal to the density threshold, then we will march the ray forward one step. Then we will check to see if the ray has passed the bounds of the sphere, and if so, discard the fragment. Lastly, else if the density is greater than the threshold, then we will display the normal color. Whoa, look at that. Now we can see inside the sphere. But the normals aren't correct. It's still calculating the normals of a sphere. Not a problem though. All we have to do is go to this get normal function and replace this SDF sphere function with the noise 3D function. All right, so now we're seeing the normals of the noise texture. Looks pretty cool. But now the issue is that on this flat surface of the sphere on the outside, it's showing the normals of the noise texture at that point, not the normals of a sphere, which doesn't look natural. Luckily, we can make it look normal by going to this part of the fragment function where the ray initially hits the surface of the sphere. Before entering the volume ray march loop, we check the noise value at the surface of the sphere, and if it is above the threshold, instead of calculating the noise normal, we can just normalize P to get the normal direction of the surface of the sphere. Nice, that's exactly how we want it to look. Let's look at the whole thing. I'll set the render mode to cold disabled as well so I can see really close up to it. So some things to note here, you can see that the normals have some jarring transitions and the distance between these lines are related to the volume step size we configured. Increasing the step size will also increase the distance between the noise samples and as a result these normal lines will be further apart and the volume is much less accurate. Keeping the volume step size at 0.005 seems to have the best appearance and performance for me. Also notice that since we are allowed to adjust the step size, smaller step sizes will require more steps to march through the entirety of the object. So we can see if we reduce max steps, the rays do not march through the whole mesh and get no color assigned to them, so they return black. In this Jeremy Pelliard example, he fixes those lines on the normals by adding an additional smooth normals option, which ray marches yet again with an adaptive step size to get more accurate samples of the surface normal. I am not going to do that because this slows down my computer enough as it is, so if you want to include smooth normals, 
go check out the source code on his GitHub page and feel free to try to implement it yourself. However, he does add a cool distortion effect to the shape by distorting the UVW coordinates that are passed to the noise texture. It is a super simple function that looks like this. Basically copied straight from Jeremy's code. We are going to use the power function to raise two times the length of the vector p to the power of our deformation variable, and we divide it by two. This distorts the UVW space used to generate the noise texture logarithmically, and I believe multiplying and dividing by two on both ends is a way of fine-tuning this feature. Now lastly, let's animate some certain properties, like the noise transform. So I'm going to split up the axes of noise transform so I can manipulate them independently. We can animate properties using the built-in time variable, and I'm just going to use it with the sign function to animate all three axes. Cool. Now if we want to manipulate the frequency of the sine wave, we will add in this anim speed variable and multiply time by that. And you can also see that the sine waves are moving in phase with each other. Just add some radian values to time to offset the phase. 0.5 and 1.5 seem to work well for me. So that's pretty much it. Pretty cool. Thanks for watching.